everyone, thank you for joining us here today. I hope you're enjoying the event so far. My name is Doug. I am a developer advocate with the Firebase team. And I'm you, Brian, from the Firebase team as well. And we thought it, uh, it would be good to tell you about how you can use Firebase products to test your app. Now, the, the, um, the title of this talk is, How Can Firebase Improve the User Experience of Your App? And I thought it might be nice to tell you about that, but it's even better, I think, to show you. And so that's what we'd like to do today. We'd like to show you how we used Firebase in an app that we built called Friendly Picks. Now, Friendly Picks is an app that you can use to share pictures with friends, kind of like a social network. It's open source for iOS, Android, and the web. Uh, we use it as a demo app to showcase Firebase APIs and products. Now, like all apps, there are problems during development. We experienced this. Um, Ibrahim, Remember that time when the cloud storage for Firebase SDKs changed? Uh, we had some problems with that. Uh, yes, I remember that, Doc. Actually, that was a strange time. You were just ready to publish your first app. And the QA tests were successful. And we just want to give it a try to the test lab. And test lab let you test your app in the wide variety of devices, in Android and iOS, on, they are hosted on the cloud. Let's see on our app. While we were testing, we realized that we got an error on the test upload photo. And this test was failing. And it was pretty weird, because we didn't see this issue while we were testing ourselves. So in this case, we can even see the logs and some video here from the test. As you can see here, the app is starting. And we picked like a photo. And the test is going through, writing a caption. And it clicked Upload Picture. And the upload is happening right now. And it seems like it's going well, but our app crashed. So that was weird that our app crashed when it wasn't crashing before. And looking at this, we realized that it was in the Upload site, in the Upload View controller. So let's go back to our code. And we realized that the download URL was a property before, but it was deprecated. And now it was an async call. And as soon as we fixed the error, our test was like working as normal. And since then, we are using the XC test. And we created some more UI tests as well. So we go through our app. And we have a reliability that our app always works. Let's see like a, one of our tests, which was on an iPhone CX. I did it like a few days ago. As you can see here, it's accepting some permissions going through privacy, going through the authentication, going through and selecting a photo, uploading it. Now we're going to go to upload screen, writing a caption, upload it. And we even went there and added a comment. So our text was successful. This was a particularly close save, and it was a really good save for us. Because if we shipped our app, and it would crash in the very first users, that would be a terrible experience, and it really saved us from some one-star reviews from there. Yeah, for sure, early one-star one -star reviews in your app would be bad. It would certainly tank your ratings in any market. So obviously, it's crucial to test your app before you publish it. Uh, some of the members of the test lab team say you should test in the lab, not on your users. Now, this is obvious advice. Uh, so, Ibrahim, I'm curious, how many iOS devices were you able to test on? Oh, right now, actually, we have like 12 iOS devices on the test lab, and we can through different iOS versions as well. Okay, yeah, and on, uh, and I'm an Android developer. I've done a lot of Android development, and I know all too well that it can be very challenging to test on a wide array of devices. You know, landscape, portrait, tablet, phone, Android TV, all these different devices. It's challenging to do it well. And it's good for consumers to choose. They should choose the devices that fit their budget and lifestyle. Uh, I think in Test Lab, there's something like 40 devices to choose from, and there's new ones being added all the time. Now, Ibrahim showed you that you can write an XC test for your, for your iOS app. Now, it's worth noting that on Android, the similar framework is called Espresso, so you can write tests to sort of remote control your application. But if you're not into writing code for your tests, you can still use something called RoboTest. So te Test Lab has a fully automated intelligent crawler that will try to exercise as the most of your app as it can. And you can see right here how it's sort of automatically clicking and navigating, toggling buttons, choosing menu items. Uh, you don't have to write any code at all to do that here. So that's great. So you can get started testing right away. If you're doing an Android app and you haven't done any testing at all, there's no excuse not to do this, because there's a free allotment of daily tests that you can run in Test Lab. 
So test lab is good to use before you publish, but um, what do you do after you publish? Well, many people are using Firebase test lab in their continuous integration system, so they can build and test, build and test repeatedly, maybe with every check-in, maybe just nightly. But after you publish, after you've done, finished that cycle, it's too late. Um, so if there's crashes that you haven't found, those could still reach your users. The fact of the matter is it's difficult to predict and test all these corner caches. Your app may still crash in the hands of your users. Now, Ibrahim, we found a really nasty bug in friendly picks, right? Oh, uh, yes, Doc. Actually, this was our first bug. Right after we shipped the app, you know, we were happy. We shipped the app and some celebrations. And we get this new fatal issue email. And let's see what's going on there. So we went to the Crash Ethics console. As we see, the crash free statistics went from 100% all the way to 70% in a matter of days. So it was really scary for us. But we went through and we see that it was in the first version. We see how many people are affected. And we went through and we see that it was on the FB user. So we got some like really good insight to what's happening there. Instead of like the, sometimes the Xcode may not give you the best stack trace, but we have some clean stack trace here. And by using this, let's go back to our code. Then I found out that I was always, while I was building the app, I was expecting the full name to be never null. But the web client was sending null. So sometimes you can avoid everything. And in this case, we've managed to like, talk with the web client developer as well. We fixed on both sides, and we made sure that this issue would never occur again. Since then, we were able to add a note here, what happened here, and we closed the back. We shipped a new version, and as you see, as soon as we shipped the version, our crash-free users went all the way to 100%. But we learned some lesson here, and we also integrated with the Slack. And with the Slack integration, now when we have any alert like this, we get an alert right in our ch Slack channel, and all our developers from different clients can jump in and talk to each other and start the conversations again. And also, we start using the user identifier in the crash ethics, which you can set. So in our crash reports, we can get some user ID. This gives us like another valuable information that if there's a data offending us, we can find it. Maybe we can try to actually make up to this user. Maybe even send a push notification saying that our app is like much better now. Do you want to try again? Give us a chance. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's kind of funny that you uh, use Crashlytics in the iOS app, but we ended up finding a bug in the web app. Um, but it goes to show that sometimes it's good to be paranoid about the data that's coming into your app, even if it's coming from a server you control. Now, there's another problem that pretty much all mobile software engineers have struggled with at some point, and that's race conditions. Let's be honest, threading is really difficult to get right, even for us at Firebase. It's just not easy to predict how all of your asynchronous and threaded work are going to interact with each other. Uh, we had a problem like this in Friendly Picks, didn't we? Uh, indeed, yes, Doc. And here we get another fatal issue. And this time we had like, some load feed, one closure, another closure. This was like harder to replicate, because this bug only happened when there are multiple people actually interacted. And in this case, let's go to our app to give us some idea what's happening there. So you see like, I have, like some fees in my main view controller. As I move to another view controller, I actually, since I'm using the real-time database, I had those async listeners. And now I want to disconnect those listeners so they are not running on the back and as a stale. But if I want to go back to my original view controller, I don't want to load the entire feed from scratch. Instead, I just want to like upload and I update and see if those data is still live. And if it's changed, I want to change it here as well. And so I'm like creating some new listeners. And I'm checking if those data is still there. Let's say this index 0, my own post, was deleted on the back end. I came here. I asked the question. The async call returned, saying that that post was deleted. Should I go and delete index zero? Uh, that was the problem I had. Because when I did that, I didn't realize there were other async threads was going on. They may actually edit another feed to my feed, another post to my feed. So my index may have already changed. And to find out and to prove this theorem, I actually added some like other custom keys, like adding some other counts for different stages of my code using the custom keys on the crash ethics. And I was able to compa compare from some crash reports. And at the end, we came to a solution in our listen post. And anywhere we update the code, instead of relying on some index pads, we have to find the new index using the post ID. 
And after we did that, we also started integrating with PagerDuty. Now we get pagers for the on-call developers. And we had the Jira integration. So we start triaging those bugs. And last bit that earlier they mentioned about the Crashitics Data Studio dashboard and with the BigQuery exports. So we started using it as well. By exporting our Crashitics data to Data Studio, to BigQuery, and using the template that already came out from the Crashitics, we have some real valuable data here. We can see crash trends through different versions, different devices, and through like different keys and by files. So we can see some trends, and if there's like some problematic data over there, or problematic file, we can go through and maybe try to refactor it. So uh, obviously, crashes are the biggest threat to the UX of your app. And you can use uh, BigQuery visualization to monitor trends of crashes in your app. But there's an even more insidious problem that can happen, and that's the overall performance of your app. If your app is stuck loading something, or if it can't launch very quickly, that's going to cause frustrations to your users. And sometimes I like to call that a soft crash, because if your app isn't doing what the user expects, it might as well have just crashed, because the user is going to leave in frustration. So when you develop your app, you're probably building in your home or your office with a great Wi-Fi connection and a fast connection to the internet. And you're probably using the latest hardware for development, so all the latest devices, in order to tighten up your test and debug cycles. But this is not likely going to be the situation for your end users who might have poor connections on low-end devices. It's really important to notice, if you want to collect performance data for your app, you need to do it from your user's point of view. So whatever your users are experiencing, you need to know what that is. And we found some performance issues in friendly picks, didn't we? What did we discover? Yeah, actually, we built our app usually using like the Wi-Fi and the latest devices. But sometimes we can omit those issues. We didn't see those issues while we were developing. And using the performance metrics, we can collect those data, and we can analyze it. And here, let's go to our console. As you can see here, I have some app start trace and some network response latency varying through different countries. Let's see what's going on here. The app start is like a particularly important issue, because even if your app didn't crash, if it is starting really late, some users may assume that your app is crashed, or they think it's not responding, and they won't, start, they won't use your app anymore. So if you go through, and I'll just go through some versions, and maybe explain some what are the improvements we made so far. And one of the issues was I was just explaining, we are loading all the async calls. As, to, as much as we could, now we are trying to load them async from different threads. And at the end, we try to get sync them together, merge them together. And the other things like we found that I was not cropping like the full-size images as I was letting people down upload files as big as they want. And that was crazy, some crazy download times when our app was starting. So we fixed that issue as well. And going through that, now we see like some different devices. And in our version, we can see that we start with the real app sort slow app start time. We work through it as we had some new features like blocking users and other permissions. We kind of slow our app. But we are always working in this loop to make it as fast as it can be. Yeah, the performance monitoring dashboard is very helpful to identify problems, the performance problems in your app, and then also use it to verify that you actually fixed it. So getting a before and after view is very helpful. Now, you may have noticed from what Ibrahim showed you, the dashboard is displaying data in aggregate. So you're looking at averages, sometimes among all of your users. Aggregates are really good because it's showing you all of the data from all of your users or maybe just a slice of your users. But you can't possibly process every single user's data all at once. But sometimes aggregate data doesn't tell the whole story. Sometimes you do need to deep dive into a particular performance session. Now, earlier today, you may have noticed that the Firebase performance team launched a whole new feature that lets you browse and examine individual performance sessions. So you can deep dive into the performance characteristics on a particular device for a particular user at a particular period of time. Now, Ibrahim, I know that you were able to give this a close look before it shipped. What did you discover in Friendly Picks? Uh, actually, Friendly Picks was one of the early adopters. So we'll actually go through like real data we collected from a real app. And this was a little bit bare with me. We'll see how it, work, how it works there. So I'll dive into one of the sessions I have. I will see in this particular stage, th this is the app's, app start time. This is my feed view. Somehow, my, even my feed view was loaded, 
my first view, but we get stuck on the old picker. So something went bad around the authentication that it went 15 seconds. So either something was like wrong with the permissions or the app that made really you this user stall. Let's look at another session. Let's look at the one we were seeing some info about it. Here we go. This is an iPhone 6 device. It was a little older device. And I suspect something different happened here. As you see, it took more than two seconds just for my field view even start loading. I suspect either my app was too big or I was doing some animations and other stuff that made the app like really slow to even get loaded. So using this kind of real data and some like real metrics, we can actually understand what's going on with our app. And we can tailor our app so it can work as fast as it can be through different devices and in different conditions as well. Yeah, so thank you, Ibrahim, for that close look at uh, everything that's new in Test Lab and Crashlytics and performance monitoring. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed the content today. I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Now, uh, Ibrahim and I will be around and about the conference in uh, works workshops, Ask Firebase, other parts of the conference. Feel free to flag us down and talk to us about performance issues or anything else that you come up with. Thank you, and we'll see you later. Yep.